Okay, so welcome back everyone. Uh, for our last kind of session for today, uh, we're going to have a talk with Warner about Unix history and whatever else Warner would like to talk about. So I'm going to turn over to Warner and let you run the show here for a while. Okay, sounds good. Um, <clears throat> I sent you a message on Slack, um, but if people have questions and stuff, um, uh, they should, uh, you know, raise them on the appropriate place. And I'm happy to stop and take a tangent in this talk at any time. Okay. Uh, so just, you know, kind of a, a, a point of order or a bookkeeping. And I'm also happy to go back or whatever. This is a talk I've given several times. You're not going to disrupt my uh, flow. Um, it does have a couple of interesting new things in it. So I'm going to try to share my screen and uh, get going with this. And, ah, okay, so if life is good, we should, you should see my title slide. Um, oh, looks good from here. So, Okay, so I'll, I'll assume it's gonna look good. I'm gonna start talking. And if people want to interrupt or ask me something or, hey, I heard this other thing was true, um, just let me know. Uh, so, um, uh, oops, oh, come on. Okay, my presentation is being a little bit fussy. So I'm gonna talk about um, kind of the early history of Unix. A couple of years ago, Unix turned 50 years old and Bell Labs had a, a big event about it. This was in the, one of the last big uh, get togethers that they had before COVID time. So this is in 2019. Um, and this year, in fact, earlier this month is the 50th anniversary of the first edition of Unix. Um, <clears throat> in the early days, the first few editions of Unix, they didn't really have good, um, configuration management or release control or anything. When they thought things were kind of complete, it's like, yeah, let's go print the manuals now. Um, and so a lot of the artifacts from the early days of Unix aren't what we'd want them to be. I'll get into some of the details of that a little bit later, but fortunately we have the first edition programmer's manual. And this is just kind of a, a screenshot of uh, what we're doing. Um, and how that's different from what we do now is that, you know, there's a tag I could find FreeBSD 1.0 in our repository, um, or maybe 2.0 in our repository and 1.0 in a different repo. Um, you didn't have anything close to that at all. So there's, there's a lot of paper trail that we have today that um, the early days of Unix didn't even have. So um, anyway, let's uh, move on. Um, what inspired me to create this talk was there's kind of a standard history of Unix that I'm sure everybody's seen talks like this. These were all the rage in 2019. Um, <clears throat> and so I've condensed it into like three slides that you know is the usual treatment. So if you wanna um, just hang out for these three slides and go get some lunch, um, you'll have the standard history. You won't have any of the juicy other tidbits I'll be sharing, but you know, maybe you're hungry. Um, so in the typical history of Unix, uh, it all starts at Bell Labs in the mid 60s when they had decided that um, they didn't wanna do uh, their own OS. They wanted to kind of outsource it. They had been running their own um, kind of uh, OS like thing, but it didn't have all the features they wanted and it didn't have all the uh, <clears throat> features that they needed. So they got together with GE and MIT and they created the Multics Consortium. And the Multics Consortium was designed to create the state-of-the-art operating system on a bunch of different mainframes that were at the time. And about five years in, they decided, no, nah, this is too bureaucratic. We don't like it, whatever. It's not making good progress. We're gonna quit. And so one of the people working on the Multics effort at Bell Labs was Ken Thompson. And since he suddenly had time on his hands, um, he found this spare scrounge, this spare PDP-7 that was located a couple floors below his office and wrote Unix for it. 
and people started using it and it was cool and all and that gave them enough credibility to sell to the patent office that uh, they could do all their typesetting with the unix system and so the patent office bought them a um pdp 11 and they uh ported unix to it and then unix was rewritten in c um when uh, c was mature enough to handle it um, and then about 1975, it was released to universities and uh, things start happening. Some of the first ports to other platforms happen. And all of this, some of the, that stuff was looped back to Bell Labs. And um, when the seventh edition came out, everything exploded. It got ported to, to everywhere. All the pent up demand was suddenly released. Um, and then uh, for various reasons, AT&T wasn't able to market Unix and that job fell to Berkeley. So uh, Berkeley added networking to Unix and it just was nuts. Um, and then the AT&T was broken up. This dissent decree was uh, that had uh, prevented them from entering software business was voided and system five goes commercial. And this led to the Berkeley system five wars uh, from the eighties and to the rise of Linux and open source in the 90s. Um, you know, pretty standard history. And that's why we have three lines of um, code today um, that all trace their history directly or indirectly back to uh, AT&T Unix. Um, yeah, we have iOS, iOS and Mac OS, which are running Mach, which borrowed heavily from BSD and contributed to BSD. Um, there's FreeBSD and NetBSD and um, all the other BSDs uh, that we have as well today. And then there's Linux and Android, um, which are on a number of phones as well as iOS. So um, pretty much every phone that's out there uh, is running some version of Unix. And I have a dotted line here because Linux adopted the system five APIs and uh, to a certain extent in some areas, it's the system five architecture um, uh, initially. And so that, that's a, a borrowing of concepts, not a borrowing of code. And everybody's heard this history and um, it really doesn't tell you a whole lot some of the excitement that was going on in the early days of Unix. So in this talk, I'm gonna talk about research Unix and some of the things that were going on and some of the history that seems to have been lost or that I never learned until I started delving into this uh, topic extensively. And I like to think of myself as fairly well read. Um, <clears throat> Solaris did not sue at and I'm gonna hand act to that right now. Solaris is system five and um, it would belong on, um, let's see. It would belong as a, whoa, whoa, that's not working like I expected. It would belong off of a line off of um, the system five chart. Um, basically uh, Solaris um, is an operating system so it can't really sue anybody. Um, Sun never sued AT&T. Uh, they bought a paid up license from uh, Caldera so that they could do open, uh, Solaris, which has all the system five code they could release um, and so forth. Um, the AT&T lawsuit is when AT&T actually sued BSDI, which is um, kind of in the early days of um, uh, the FreeBSD project, which is kind of a, a whole different talk. Uh, Kirk does uh, some information, uh, has a talk about that. and. I could put together a talk for the future about that, but that's not what I'm prepared to talk about today. Um, but yeah, Solaris is from that, but who's running Solaris today? Um, just a few people that have legacy Spark systems. It's not um, as a major player as these other systems are. And you know, there's another of other minor players that we could put on this chart too, but I wanted to have a nice clean chart here. Um, there'll be a more complicated chart later in the talk that has some of this when I get towards the end. <clears throat> um, the difference between microkernel services and uh, monolithic kernel um, 
is an interesting uh, discussion. Um, I'm not gonna get into that at all today either. Um, but basically the difference between a, a microkernel and a megalithic kernel is that in a um, megalithic kernel or a, a monolithic kernel, um, all the codes in one space, there's no protection from between each other, uh, uh, but they do that so it's because it's very, very fast. And in a microkernel, each part has its own compartmentalization. Each part does a simple little thing and passes messages back and forth between each other, either via API calls or in message queue or you know, some other mechanism. Uh, and uh, you know, that's an interesting uh, design. Um, and that was actually one of the criticisms that Andy Tannenbaum had about the first release of Linux was that it had gone the uh, monolithic kernel route. Um, but, uh, you know, apart from that, I'm not going to talk uh, about that uh, much uh, further. Um, so uh, let me get on with where I'm going with this, I guess. Uh, so I thought I'd focus on the early history of Unix and some of the lost and found things, some of the early firsts in Unix that happened uh, when I discovered them, you know, five, 10, 15 years before I thought that they had actually happened. Um, and so uh, some of my slides are set up to be kind of interactive before an audience and I don't really have that today. So um, uh, I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll adapt, I guess. Um, but before I get started, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to the Unis Historical Society, or TWOs. This is a group of people um, that uh, have made it their business to preserve the early history of Unix. Um, it was founded by William Toomey, um, and it was an outgrowth of PUPS, which was the PDP Unix Preservation Society. And this was kind of a a group that was kind of shadowy before the um, Caldera license of ancient Unixes um, that said, if you had a copy of Unix, here's how you would install it. But they wouldn't be able to provide you a copy officially. Um, and out of that grew twos when it was you were able to distribute the source code, distribute the binaries uh, more freely. Um, a number of artifacts came to light and twos has tried to catalog and archive them and give them the proper context. A lot on the twos mailing list, there's a lot of old timers. Uh, Ken Thompson's on the list. Um, and uh, whenever I say something that's wrong about uh, early Unix, you know, he's uh, all, well, uh, this is what I remember. Uh, and he's, he's a great guy. You know, he's never mean or nasty about it. Um, and it's always just, yeah, and you know, are you gonna argue with Ken Thompson or are you gonna, you know, listen to what he has to say. Um, so as far as the early artifacts, um, nothing before the fifth edition was really around before the twos project got going. And by finding a number of lost tapes, listings, OCRs, and some community effort, um, there are a number of artifacts that the twos um, uh, website has now um, that I'll talk about later in the talk. Uh, that are, are from these early things. So that's why we have a PDP-7 image that we, you can download and run in simulation. Um, that's why we have um, uh, kind of an early first, second edition thing that, we can, that, you, can, that you can run. Um, in addition, there were, even um, with as uh, careful as Berkeley became about their release structure, there were a couple of things that were missing. And um, one of the efforts was, um, 4.1, we didn't have a good pristine tape. Um, we had bits from here and bits from there. And so people went through and very carefully curated together a, um, a, a restored tape, but it was as close as we could get. Um, I also did some of that for the 2.11 BSD on the PDP 11s, but um, you know, since that's after research Unix, I'm not gonna talk too much about that uh, today. And the other people I want to give a shout out to are BitSavers. This is Al Kassaw's organization. Um, and he's been scanning and putting documentation online for the last 20 years. And in fact, he's spawned a number of independent efforts and they're all kind of confederated together. So if you are writing an emulator for an old machine and need to know how this particular disk drive or this disk controller or the serial port worked um, so that you can emulate it, you can go and find original documentation 
uh, original schematics, all of this stuff um, uh, that is there. Al has been doing this under the auspices of the Computer History Museum in Mountain View. Uh, and he's got a huge pile of stuff that needs to be scanned. Plus he accepts scans from uh, third parties that have found uh, interesting original documentation, not just related to Unix, but any of the early machines, any of the early OSs. Um, you know, he'll put it up if, you, if the quality passes um, his uh, standards. So um, this is a different aspect of history preservation. Um, so it occurs to me, I gave this talk in Europe and nobody in Europe knows what AT&T is because uh, AT&T doesn't have a big presence in Europe and whatever presence it has um, isn't the same AT&T as um, we had before. Uh, and also most people around today never knew the phone company, Ma Bell, the phone company. So I'm gonna say a few words about that. So AT&T is the American Telegraph and Telephone Company. And they had the phone company monopoly. Whenever somebody made a long distance call, they made money. And the United States is a huge, huge country. So they made a lot of money over the years. And they used this money um, to found uh, Bell Labs. And one of the things Bell Labs did was basic research. Um, the transistor came out of Bell Labs. Um, measurement of the background cosmic radiation of the Big Bang came out of Bell, Bell Labs. Um, and so it's been very influential in addition. Unix has come out of Bell Labs and a number of other pieces of software. It's not the only software um, that is there. And the other thing you need to understand is uh, AT&T was operating through 1982 um, under a consent decree that said, you're a monopoly, we'll give you that monopoly, but you can only use that monopoly for things related to the monopoly. So they couldn't get into selling software. So early versions of Unix, um, were provided as is, here's a nice little gift. Um, we're not providing support. Um, and that all changed in 1982 when AT&T was broken up and they started to monetize System 5 um, aggressively. Um, so that's kind of the uh, uh, AT&T setup. I guess AT&T is more known worldwide. I just saw a comment on, on chat. Uh, but anyway, you know, that's the environment that Unix uh, came from. It was a research facility with a bunch of PhDs who were trying to solve problems so that um, AT&T could deliver uh, long distance to its customers um, more cheaply, more efficiently, and build them for the, at as minimal cost as possible. I mean, that was kind of the background of what's going on at Bell Labs, and that's why you see um, Unix used uh, and some interesting deployments very early in the history of Unix. And I'll talk about those very shortly. Okay, so um, so what's a PDP-7? I talk about the PDP series of machines and um, years ago, I wouldn't have had to include this slide, but um, PDP uh, machines um, are basically relics that nobody knows about, nobody uses anymore. Um, but the PDB-7 was one in a line of 18-bit uh, mini computers. These were computers that were the size of a couple of refrigerators and a washing machine or two stacked next to each other if you're looking for kind of a, a mental sizing. And I've got pictures of all the models in this. There were about 100 um, PDB-7s released. It was released in 1964. Um, Unix was in 1969. One of the reasons uh, Ken was able to get the PDP-7 was that it was obsolete. Even its successor, the PDP-9 was obsolete when Ken was messing around on the PDP-7. Um, so um, this is a archive picture of the uh, delivery of a PDP-7 back in the 60s to Uppsala University in Sweden. I probably butchered pronouncing that. I've never heard it pronounced. Um, I'm sure the comments will light up because of that. But it was so large that they had to build special scaffolding, punch a hole in the wall, uh, take out a window, uh, and use a crane to deliver it into the room upstairs where it was going to uh, eventually reside. Um, here's a, a photo of a slightly restored PDP-7. Um, I got this uh, from a site that uh, specializes in PDP-7 uh, Arcania. Um, but this has a number of um, different uh, features. 
um, on it. And uh, let's see. Yeah, that's not going to let me do it. Um, I was hoping to be able to. Oh, wait. Uh, let's see if I can draw on here. Um, so, you know, this had the front panel, um, which you would toggle addresses into to uh, load things into memory so you could run programs on the machine. And when things uh, crashed, you'd use the front panel to examine memory addresses to see, you know, what the state of the machine is. Um, there's a tape reader here. Um, these are some uh, uh, additional indicators for memory and CPU. And then you've got um, uh, a deck tape reader here, and there's two of them. Uh, and then a teletype, which is why everything's called TTY these days. TTY is short for teletype. And it was literally this typewriter that could be computer controlled. Um, and so if life is good, I'll be able to move on. Hold on. Um, okay, so um, Ken's new system. Uh, Ken Thompson actually was kind of depressed a little bit about um, the Multics project going away. And so we played a lot of a game called Space Travel. And in this game, you would zoom around between the different planets. Um, they had different gravity and you try to land on them. Um, unfortunately, uh, it was kind of expensive to play it on the mainframe that they had bought for the um, Multics project. And it was 50 or $75 a game. And you know this was uh, Phony Baloney Labs budget money, but Ken played enough of it that it was noticed by management. So he started casting about for what to do, you know? Um, so he eventually found this uh, cast off PDP-7 um, that was in the visual and acoustics department that they had used it for different um, speech and sound research uh, because of the phone company and they transmitted sound. They got a lot of money. So they had a lot of old toys and this was one that they had just cast off and was gathering dust and hadn't been decommissioned yet. Um, so Ken rewrote space travel in PDP-7 assembler um, using a cross assembler that he wrote and put on, on the uh, GE GCOS machine. Um, and then he would create a paper tape and load it. And uh, you know that made him, he could play um, uh, <clears throat> space travel under the radar, kind of the first video game addiction feeding development you know, that we have. Um, in the uh, history of Unix. Um, and uh, this is a picture of the screen that you interact with. Um, you know, there, there was a, a, a light pen that you could use to, to do interactions and there was a keyboard you could type into um, as well. Um, and this weird thing I have up in the corner up here is the only screenshot that we have available from space travel, at least from the original period. I'll get into space travel a little bit more later on in the talk. Um, but uh, so, hold on. come on, my slide is being a little slow. Uh, my slide is being very slow, please bear with me. There we go. So um, PDB-7 Unix is largely a footnote in the Unix history. If it's talked about at all, it was because people had some awareness that it was the 50th anniversary and it was the thing that preceded PDP-11 Unix. Um, it ran on four or five machines in Bell Labs. Um, and that might seem like you know some trivial thing, but they were the right machines at the right time in front of the right people. And that um, allowed, uh, uh, Ken Thompson um, and uh, Dennis Ritchie to uh, pitch this idea to management um, to buy them a PDP-11. Um, and management didn't quite go for it, but uh, um, the uh, patent office did. 
they needed some way to typeset their patent application. So they um, said, sure, we'll buy you a machine. We'll try it out, see if it works. Um, but uh, up until maybe five years ago, almost nothing was known about this early system. Um, all the sources had been lost, no the documentation, nobody could find anything other than a few remembrances and a few histories. So, um, but everything wasn't quite lost. Uh, unfortunately, in uh, 2011, um, Robert Morris Sr. passed away. Now he was at Bell Labs uh, from 1960 to 1986 and wrote the crypt program, um, came up with Etsy password uh, and wrote a number of papers in security, a very well-respected security um, engineer, father of uh, Robert Morris Jr. who's known for other reasons. Um, but when he died, there was this huge collection of papers that he had from his time at Bell Labs. And the family um, decided to get uh, um, Doug McIlroy to sort through it. Now, Doug McIlroy was also someone who uh, was uh, early old timer. He worked on the uh, Multix project as well. And so he sorted through all these manuals and found um, uh, PDP 11 Unix manual page, um, not quite the man pages we have today, but kind of a um, explainer. And he posted this to twos. And here's a kind of a, a screenshot of it. Um, this is a draft. If you look at it closely, um, parts of this actually appear in later papers about Unix that are published in the ACM and elsewhere. Um, but a couple of things to look at. We can date this fairly accurately. Um, because of um, a couple of things. Um, uh, the first Unix has been around about a year, ran on PDP-7 and 9 computers, and a more modern version, which is a few months old on PDP-11. So this places it sometime in the spring of 1971, maybe, um, because that's when the PDP-11 port uh, started, um, well in advance of the first edition. Um, and it talks about things uh, like the B programming language. Um, and if you go through, it talks about a number of other things that um, uh, will become standard Unix fare. Um, but that was it. And then the next year, um, Norm Wilson was going through his attic um, and found a copy of uh, the first half of the Unix book, which um, was this big printout that had uh, lived in the um, computer room at Bell Labs, the Unix lab in Bell Labs. And so he had copied it and saved away a copy and didn't think anything of it. Um, but it turns out that this uh, copy of Unix um, was the PDP-7 assembler for the kernel and a number of user land things. And so again, twos jumps into action, uh, a bunch of people um, you know, take the OCR scans and whatnot. And um, then uh, uh, they, um, you know, create a system that was bootable. And I've included a GitHub link if you want to take a look at it. But that's not all. Um, the second half of the book turned up in uh, the papers of Dennis Rich. And to celebrate uh, in 2019, the 50th anniversary of Unix, um, the Computer History Museum uh, released scans of that uh, as well. And the two people jumped in, added the missing pieces and updated. And space travel was part of the missing sources. Um, great, we can play space travel again. Well, maybe, I'll get to that in a second. One of the things that this allowed was um, the Living uh, Computer History Museum uh, up in Seattle had a working PDP-7, one of the few in the world. And they, were, they didn't have the right um, RC09, RB09 disk that um, the uh, original Unix used, but they kind of hacked together something that was close um, and called it a JK09. Um, and they were able to boot Unix um, using the two source base. So um, this is uh, 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 part of their video where they have just loaded the tape um, that loads Unix and that's Unix booting. 
Um, as you can see, it's much quieter than it is today. Unix was always very uh, quiet in its uh, booting. Um, and so there's a link to that in, in my talk. Um, I'll share the slides um, after I'm done. I usually do that beforehand, but didn't think to do that. Um, unfortunately, the Living History Museum in Seattle is uh, kind of in a state of limbo. Uh, its founder, Paul Allen, died a few years ago and um, left it in trust to his sister. And uh, they were forced to close during COVID and with no income coming in, um, all the staff was let go and all the exhibits were put into mothballs. And Paul Allen's sister decided, yeah, I don't wanna run something like this. And so it's unclear what's gonna happen to that collection. Um, yeah, there's no beep, no beep at all. It is a tragedy. Um, sorry, I'm reacting to an IRC comment. Uh, so that's kind of the state of affairs for the Computer History Museum. It used to be you could go and watch it every so often they'd have a demo, but I don't know when the next one will be. Um, so we have the kernel sources now, and we've got um, the deck kept extensive records of all the many computers that it had. You'll notice the number of computers sold were a few hundred of each model. And so it had a huge, for the time, database of all the machines that it ever sold um, because most of them were uh, had field service contracts, maintenance contracts where DEC would come and fix it or um, uh, repair the machine if something went wrong with the machine or upgrade it um, because not too many people at the time knew how to you know, manage these big behemoths. Um, and we can uh, look uh, at the uh, kernel and we know that it's a retrofit of the um, RB09 controller, RC09 disk. Um, I confirmed that with uh, Ken Thompson. And also um, there's a manual online for the RB09 controller. And you can see that the register accesses in the Unix source matches that. Um, we also know that there's a, a, a teletype, a light pin um, uh, and two displays. Uh, this was important because it let people play um, different games or communicate uh, with each other um, as well. Um, the Graphics 2 driver is something that was um, developed by the sound uh, department um, for dealing with all of the visualizations that they needed for sound. Um, and it was prototyped on the PDP-7 uh, and we've got a lot of patent filings about when they productized it. It was something you could add to the PDP-9 to make one of the first workstations available. Um, so uh, in addition, um, in 2018, uh, the PDP-7 Unix was the winner of the International IOC Obfuscated C Contest. Uh, Chris Mills wrote a PDP-7 emulator that he used to boot um, uh, the um, version zero Unix image that the twos project had produced. And then he went a step further and wrote a PDP-11 emulator on the PDP-7 so he could boot 2.11 BSD. But you know, some people are crazy. And the IOCC, the International Obfuscated C Contest is about how crazy can you get? And can you be so crazy? They add a new rule for you next year. Um, and so I went through a detailed analysis of all these facts. And I think I have found Ken's original PDP-7. Um, in the uh, records for the um, PDP-7, it was serial number 34. Um, if you look at the number of options, you'll see that they match up. I'm not gonna do that here because I've got this detailed analysis out there. Um, and it's a quarter of a million dollar machine. Um, so it was kind of an expensive machine. Uh, it's one of the reasons why it wasn't just tossed out the door when the PDP-9s came in. It was uh, expensive um, and you know some actual capital uh, dollars and it had to depreciate completely first before they were able to um, uh, discard it. Um, so here's another picture of the PDP-7. It's very similar to the one I showed earlier. Um, it's in a slightly different configuration. This is a picture from um, a deck sales catalog. Um, and it shows the typical 
uh, configuration. Um, and the slide I showed earlier showed a number of similarities. Um, the memory controller is the same, the um, paper tape is the same, um, and uh, um, you know the you know the front panel is the same here. So all of these things sh uh, show um, you know the uh, uh, computer. So if we go back to that incredible machine video that I had a still of earlier that I just mentioned in passing, if my slides will let me. Um, you know, I think we'll see um, the serial number 34. Uh, Ken watched this. He's not sure it is, but he's not sure it isn't. He said it looks like it could be. Um, hello. Okay. Whoa. Okay, so here's the, the video. Um, you know, you can see in the background um, they're talking about computer generated music. Um, and that's why you see the um, different subtitles talking about music uh, on here. Um, and you see the little notes and you know they're drawing different wave patterns uh, on the screen. Um, but this looks a lot like um, the PDP uh, seven that was um, the original Unix ran on. So this gives you kind of a flavor for the machine that uh, um, that they that they used um, to do their uh, you know to do their thing um, or they can use to, to bring it up. It's kind of very minimal machine with, uh, compared to today. There's only 8k words of memory, which is like 18 kilobytes because they were 18 bit words. And um, my slides are being slow. Hold on one second. This lag is starting to drive me nuts. I'm going to stop sharing my video, and that should make things faster. Oh, look at that. Um, still, we have no space travel. Um, the situation is much closer. Uh, maybe the next one of these talks, I'll be able to give a demo of this uh, motivating software that uh, Ken just had to run on this PDP-7. Um, people have written a Graphics 2 simulator. Uh, uh, based on patent filings and a number of different other places where they can put together opcodes and different character sets. It almost works, but not enough to get uh, better screenshots or for me to demo it today. So, you know, that's unfortunate. So moving on, or maybe it didn't fix it. Um, so all of that, is you know the first couple of years of Unix and kind of the background or behind Unix. Um, in 1970, um, the PDP-11 was released. Uh, the initial model was uh, an 11, uh, 20. It had eight kilowords of memory, 16 kilobytes, um, and operated at uh, about 300,000 operations per second. Um, and over the next 30 years, there were a number of different models that were produced um, by the Digital Equipment Corporation that had better uh, capacity um, than uh, the original one. Hey, Ginger, come here. I'm sorry, my dog is running away. Dang it. <clears throat> I will go attend to that in a moment. Um, oh yeah, she's not actually going anywhere. Um, so the first edition of Unix um, was for the PDP-1120. And this is a very primitive machine. Um, there was no um, memory management. There was no um, really anything. So everything was swapped in, swapped out. There was a single user at a time. Um, the first um, edition of Unix was a basically a transliteration of the PDP-7 assembler. They took the PDP-7 assembler and didn't change its structure or form at all and made it the PDP-11 assembler well, without even any of the fancy macros that were available at the time. Um, we have no tapes from this time uh, survive, but we have um, reconstructed uh, sources 
um, that let us um, uh, put together um, you know, a, a system that you can boot. Um, the sources that we have are from an internal training presentation that uh, walk you through the structure of the kernel and have as an appendix a, a complete listing of the kernel. Um, here's uh, kind of a flavor for that. The um, walkthrough is done by a series of handwritten slides um, that uh, uh, you can see on the screen. And um, this corresponds to the um, set UID system call, which um, basically um, moves the process ID um, or compares the process ID to see if it's allowed. And if it is, um, it, uh, uh, it, it's permitted, otherwise it, bounce, it bounces out to an error routine. And get UID is similar, and then it, they both return. Um, shortly after the first edition, um, a new PDP 1145 arrived. Um, this was six or nine months later. And by then there were, the, there were 10 installations of Unix. Um, and they started to uh, rearrange the, um, started to rearrange the uh, structure of the sources so they could support the uh, PDP 1145. It had an MMU, it had um, some additional uh, instructions. And so they reorganized everything so they could use that. Um, and so this is where um, the, uh, we start to get um, a, a full-blown C compiler. It's changed from being MB or new B to being C. And um, a couple of the commands have been rewritten in C, but the kernel's still all in assembly. The third edition uh, came out a little bit later. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, a little bit over a year after the first edition. And it's basically transitioned to the 1145. It's a much better machine. And the first edition is what you run on the 1120. And so they have an explicit warning about that in their introduction saying, hey, if you got one of these older machines, this new Stoke code isn't for you. So they supported the initial machine for less than a year. So they had a very quick deprecation process. So this is the first deprecation of an old machine that I can find. Um, again, um, no binary snapshots exist. Um, we have an early C compiler from this release, uh, but not much else. Um, uh, we do have the man pages, uh, both the sources and the scan man pages. And we're up to 16 um, now. Fourth edition, the 1120 is gone completely. Um, the 1140 is taking its place. It's a slightly cheaper version of the 1145. Um, and um, it's been a complete rewrite in C, or almost complete rewrite in C. And now there's 20 installations that are using this. Um, so already in the first few years, there are four rewrites in four years of the system. Um, and um, they got tired of rewriting everything. So in 73, they did the C rewrite and the, the, the structure would remain basically unchanged all the way through system three and even into system five for some parts of the kernel. <clears throat> um, we have an almost complete um, uh, kernel that was written in C. Uh, it was on a tape called NSYS for new system, um, but it was just before the fourth edition. It was complete, except it didn't have the addition of pipes to it yet. Now the rest of the system is lost. Um, they were stored on other tapes. Um, and uh, they um, really didn't survive the test of time too well. Um, and so the, either they weren't be able to be recovered or um, when they tried to recover early tapes, they just weren't to be found. Um, and this is kind of a key version because this is the version that the, um, is described in papers. Um, we have, this is the first edition that's sent to universities. Um, this is the first, uh, around this time, USTIX forms. And if you look at the source, this looks uh, very typical of um, later code. You have the U area, which 
has basically disappeared today, has been moved into the struct proc and struct thread. I'm gonna put an asterisk by that, very rough. Um, but you know, it shows that the original code was very, um, uh, very simple. And you know, uh, argument zero for set UID was passed in in register zero. So it's just a, um, an assignment. When the trap for the system call happened, it copied it into the argument array. So it's, it's a very simple, straightforward um, implementation. Uh, this is the um, version that was um, the basis for the Unix timeshare paper. Um, uh, Ken and Dennis gave a talk uh, at the fourth symposium on operating systems um, in 1973. Um, and if you go and look at the um, proceedings from this uh, talk, you'll find this is the paper that they presented. So it's just the abstract and nothing else. Uh, the full paper would come along uh, the following summer um, and it was published in the communications of the ACM. I've included a, a reproduction here um, that you can get if you're interested. And um, this was the first uh, and best reference for Unix for the next five years until the, um, there's a, an edition of the Bell System Technical Journal uh, that came out that had um, all of the, um, that had an update for the seventh edition uh, for the forthcoming seventh edition of Unix. And so, um, uh, the other thing, if you do a literature search at this time, you start to see the first references to Unix pop up even before this paper was published. And I got all excited. Ooh, there are earlier papers than the Thompson and Ritchie paper. Uh, well, no, no, there are other people uh, at Bell Labs who published and typeset their uh, papers using TROF. And the uh, reference to Unix has said that, you know, in, in the acknowledgments at the end, this uh, paper was typeset using TROF on the Unix system. Uh, and so um, you start to see uh, Unix referenced a lot in the literature, but most of them are these little references for uh, people that, uh, you know, wrote their papers using Unix but had research areas in some other area outside of computer science. So now is a good time to pause and ask the question, what was the first fork of Unix? Um, and by fork here, I mean, when did one group take a copy of Unix and start making their own changes to it and having it evolve independently of uh, research Unix? So, um, a lot of people might say, oh yeah, that's when Berkeley took the seventh edition and did three BSD. That's really the first fork because that created the, the big fork that we have today. And um, you know, if you look at a detailed family tree, it's really 32V, but 32V was just the 32-bit VAX version of the seventh edition. So um, you know, you might think these are radically different code bases, but you can download them both and diff them and they're not that different. Um, most of you may have heard of uh, Programmer's Workbench, and um, it started in 73 and had its first release based on the sixth edition um, in 77. So that might be it. Um, but uh, internally, um, there was research Unix and then there was supported Unix, and the Unix systems group um, produced Unix TS, um, later just Unix. Um, and it had its first release in 75, just after the sixth edition was cut. Um, and you might even think MERT, um, you might have seen that Unix RT was forked from the fourth edition. Um, and you know that was actually the one that I thought when I, I was going into doing the research for this talk, but it turns out that uh, New Jersey Bell forked the first or the second edition on their PDP 1120 um, for their uh, SCCS um, deployment. Now SCCS is in the source code control system. Um, it's uh, the, um, uh, it's a switching system. I'll, I'll talk about here in a second. So there's a close, you know, four-way tie for the honors of first, but it really goes to this early group that created SCCS. Um, here's kind of a graphical view 
of the family trees. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, maybe. Um, but the SCCS system evolved into Columbus Unix. Um, it, it was called Columbus Unix because the group that maintained it um, was out of Columbus, Ohio. Um, and it was also abbreviated to CB Unix. Um, and this group out of Columbus, Ohio was um, basically created to support uh, different um, operating companies uh, deploying uh, Unix as part of their billing and switching infrastructure. Um, and so SCCS is switching control center system. Um, and basically it's a, a, a computer that they would put in the central office that controlled the switching and would write different billing records that it would then send off to um, a, a central computer for processing. Um, and this is the earliest fork I could find. Um, it pulled, it continued to pull code in from research, but it added its own innovations. Um, and it was used by a lot of different systems in the 70s and early 80s uh, that were uh, deployed by Bell uh, to do their billing and um, central switching, but it's uh, largely lost to history. Um, so some of the innovations that were added in 1974, there were semaphores uh, and line disciplines. I thought line disciplines were added by Berkeley, but turns out no, they have a much deeper uh, history. In addition, um, in 1975, what would become System 5 shared uh, memory and, and uh, was, um, was put into these. Um, and it continued through um, the mid 80s, but in the early 80s, 1982, which is the year uh, AT&T was broken up, uh, there was a concerted effort to merge all the divergent internal lines of Unix into one line that was Unix so that all the messaging to the outside world is Unix is Unix. And so um, it wasn't until 82, almost a decade later that this reconverged um, with the different internal Unix um, into what eventually became System 5. Um, if you wanted to go out and play with CV Unix, well, you can't. There's no uh, surviving tapes. Um, it's mentioned in a couple of interviews, one in Unix Review by Victor Bostowski, which is, um, uh, was a manager of Bell Labs uh, at, at the time, and Dale DeJager, who was the uh, manager of the Columbus Group. Um, there's a scan of the Unix the kernel sources, but it seems to be incomplete. You can't build a complete kernel out of it. Um, one of the reasons that was given is that it only ran on the PDP-11. And recent postings from Dale has said, no, it ran on VAXs too. That was just the internal um, gossip or uh, you know, bad mouthing that people used to um, derail um, CB Unix and have let what became System 5 eventually win. Um, you'll also find that it's mentioned in books on Unix um, system calls on IPC. Um, for example, if we look in Stevens in volume two, page 28, it talks about Columbus Unix um, being an operation support system. Um, and that's where system five IPC was derived from. You know, and so there's very little in the way of uh, preserved history here. Um, if you have any Columbus Unix memorabilia, please get in touch with me because nobody knows, uh, everybody knows it's an important part of early Unix and nobody has a copy anymore. So hypervisors are a really cool topic today. Our next first is when was the first Unix that ran under a hypervisor? Um, you know, we might look at uh, AIX running under power or Linux running under VMware. Um, that started happening around 2000. Um, but hypervisors go back a long way. IBM had hypervisors in the 60s. And so UTS from Amdahl ran under VM 370 in the early 80s. It's the first commercial Unix, I think, to do so. Um, but Bell Labs had their own port to the VM 370 hypervisor a couple of years earlier. Um, but even it wasn't the earliest. Um, 
Princeton uh, actually did the original port um, to uh, the M370. It was Tom Lyon who Amdahl later hired to do UTS. Um, so it was running in 77. Surely that's got to be it. Um, you know, this was almost one of the first Unix ports. Well, no, it turns out that the um, MERT group, which I mentioned earlier, um, had a real time version of Unix. Um, and it uh, um, ran uh, the Unix kernel as a process. Um, but uh, that's how it's described in the literature. Um, or as a hyper as a supervisor process, but really it's um, equivalent to um, uh, KVM or Hyper-V guests today. Um, merge systems would have uh, processes that controlled real-time things and processes that controlled, um, you know, time-shared stuff for when the real-time stuff wasn't doing anything. Um, and these were systems that were also connected to switching centers and did billing information. Um, as well. So they wanted a Unix-like environment, but they also wanted a real-time system. Um, and MERT allowed for this, and it used the PDP-11's uh, MMU um, and hardware capabilities to separate the different processes to make it safe to do that. So um, Unix running under hypervisors dates back to 1974, probably before most of the people that are watching this talk were born. I, mean, I was in grade school at the time. Um, you know, this chart here shows um, uh, from one of the MERT papers that appeared in the Bell System Technical Journal. Um, and the TSS um, things are different uh, processes that are running. And then, um, you know, PDP 11 supported a number of different levels. Um, the hypervisor ran basically at ring one, um, IO drivers and Unix ran at ring two. And um, some of the high priority stuff rang in room three and four. Um, and MERT was able to do this um, because uh, uh, it was able to trap the um, ironically called trap calls or EMT calls that Unix and other OSs used to do this. Uh, MERT was also able to um, run different uh, flavors of DEX running, DEX RT11 operating system. So you could run an RT11 process alongside a, a Unix uh, process as well. Um, over the years, uh, MERT um, uh, was rebranded to Unix RT. There were a couple of uh, uh, big articles, big issues uh, devoted to it uh, in the 70s. Um, it was later ported to AT&T's 3B2 or 3B20 line, um, where it provided DMERT, which was um, one of the first uh, redundant systems. One of the, um, a complete copy of Burnt ran on each of two CPUs that were in a 3B20. And if one failed, the other one would take over. And all this was later ported to Spark. And you can find some of the Spark um, manuals for DMERT online, but that's the only artifact really you can find of it. The, any of the early artifacts are lost to history. Um, even manuals don't exist, even from the people that were um, originally involved with it. So another thing that this starts to happen around the fourth edition of Unix is the programmer's workbench. And this is a, an effort um, to uh, make Unix a more friendly time-sharing system and a more friendly developing si development system. Um, and so it had a number of things that were geared to development um, for AT&T's um, IT infrastructure, which at the time there, they had a bunch of IBM mainframes and they had PDP 11s that acted as front ends for that. And people would develop their code on the PDP 11. They would manage the code with SCCS. They would build it using make and cross compilers. And then they would submit their jobs to uh, the mainframes to, to, to run um, on it. Um, there were a number of different articles um, the communication of the ACM had six articles in it in 1976. Um, the first release to appear outside of Bell Labs was the first uh, release 1.0 that the internal people did. Uh, it was based on the sixth edition plus some patches. Um, the first official release outside of Bell Labs um, was in 81. It was based on the seventh edition. And then it was largely blended in to um, the Unix TS, the Unix time sharing efforts, um, and uh, was integrated into what became system three, a precursor to system five. 
Uh, Unix TS also started about this time. And this was a group that wasn't so much focused on um, development for mainframes, but was focused more on Unix as a time sharing system more generally than PWB um, was. And this is the group that ultimately would produce system five as the different internal versions of Unix were um, merged uh, into uh, the different major versions of system five or of, 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 of the internal Unix. So in parallel to all this uh, semi-productization going on for other groups, um, you know, the world kept marching on about Six months later, we have the fifth edition of Unix. And this is where it really starts to get released to universities. A couple of tapes went out for the fourth edition that was described in the ACM, but the Bell Labs guys wanted to clean up a number of things um, and uh, make it, uh, give uh, the Unix system a proper installation tape. So they can send it out on tapes and it wasn't, um, uh, hey, we'll clone a disk and we'll send you the disk. And from there you can create a system, which it was for the most part, prior to this date. Um, they stopped listing how many, um, uh, actually, no, that's the next edition. At this point, there are maybe 50 users. So we're um, two and a half years um, past the first edition, and there's 50 uh, installations um, that are uh, using it. And it's, even though everyone's on a PDP um, 11, none of them are exactly the same, in fact, the fifth edition, one of the things that it does is it adds support for um, the PDP 1170, which was a brand new high-end um, machine that lets you have more memory, more users, more IO, larger disks. And the fifth edition starts to go out to a bunch of universities. Um, Berkeley and CMU and Harvard and Yale got the fourth edition first, um, and then they got the fifth edition when this was available. Um, it's still a mix of C and Assembler, but more things are written in C, uh, only an old version of BASIC, uh, and the Assembler um, are still written in Assembler, kind of ironic. Um, and the internal groups pull from this. Um, and it's the first version that we have an image that you can go out and run, um, but it's even still fairly limited based on that image. Ironically, it's the first version that had um, a tape installation but we don't have that tape installer. It's kind of crazy. So the next question, seems like a good time to pause. When was the first um, multiprocessor system? And um, I don't have this slide set up for the slow reveal, um, but uh, there's a long history of multiprocessing in Unix. Um, system five got it um, with um, some efforts. Uh, different companies paid AT&T to create a system five release for multiprocessor in uh, 88. Um, AT&T had two different um, multiprocessor ports in the early 80s that they reported on in the Bell System Technical Journal. Um, and MassCom um, had the first um, version, commercial version outside of AT&T. Um, they had a 68K that was multiprocessor in 82. Um, and Purdue uh, basically bolted together two 1170s with a help from a DEX engineering organization. And they had a version of uh, Berkeley Unix that ran on, on, on this that was multiprocessor. In fact, these efforts also led to a dual processor version that DEC later turned into a product. But the earliest version I could find was something called M Unix, uh, M for multiprocessor. And it was done um, by uh, Alfred Hawley and Walter Debrio Meyer at, uh, as their thesis at the Naval Post uh, Graduate School in Monterey, California. Um, and they did it in 75 on a PDP 1150, which is um, uh, an updated version. Unfortunately, um, no known copies of this uh, survive because, so um, I have to speculate that it was probably based on dates, um, it was likely based on um, the fifth edition of Unix. And if you go through and read the paper, it's, it talks about all the things that you still talked about and have to deal with in today's Unix. 
um, you have to deal with semaphores and new areas and having pointers to your areas and serializing access and all of this. Um, and strictly speaking, if you look closely at this, although the two processors share a um, share memory um, and some disks, there's different hardware on different um, connected to different processors. So different processes that were accessing um, the, this different hardware would have to run on the different processors. So there's some code, uh, the paper talks about some code that uh, talks about the scheduling to make all of that uh, happen as well. A question from Deb is that, um, from the previous slide, is do the sources for Purdue's dual VAX setup still exist? Yes, you can buy them from Kirk, or at least they're on the, um, copy of the DVD that Kirk provided to me. Um, and there are a couple of extras on that DVD that generally aren't distributed. Um, but uh, um, I don't think that's one of the things that can't be distributed. So um, you can get that. I don't know if Twos has a copy online, um, but if you're uh, interested, drop me a line and I can get you a copy. Um, the earlier, um, uh, the earlier, um, the MassCop and the AT&T ports are not available. And uh, on the internet, you can find binary copies of 4.0 MP. Um, but uh, Twos doesn't have official copies of those. So the next first that I'm gonna talk about is networking. When you think of networking, you think uh, Berkeley. Hey, Berkeley added sockets the TCP or TCP sockets to uh, Unix and um, you know under DARPA contract, so it's got to be the first. Um, well, no, there's actually a couple of earlier things that um, uh, were there. Um, Berkeley did something called BerkNet, which connected through a, a series of plug boards all the machines on campus, so that you could copy mail and run jobs everywhere. Um, Bell Labs did UUCP, Berkeley didn't have access to this, so they did their own, which was BerkNet. Um, but uh, BBN had their own TCP stack um, that was based on the sixth uh, edition. Um, and uh, um, that uh, they distributed and was actually the input into Berkeley for their development of their TCP protocol. And um, so it, uh, Kirk talks a lot better about that topic than I do. Um, he was there and he saw all the machinations that they went through. So if you're interested in that topic, I would uh, suggest um, looking up uh, prior versions of the Vendor Summit, which had that. Um, and there were a couple of earlier versions. Um, the one that I thought was the answer was uh, what was called Network Unix which um, had the uh, um, network control protocol, NCP predated TCP. Um, and it was what was used on the Ar uh, ARPANET originally. And if you go back and look at the early ARPANET maps, um, starting in about 1975, there's an explosion of PDP 11s that are on the network um, be because of this. Um, and so, uh, you know, you might think that was the first version of networking, but really um, version three and version four had a, um, a spider driver and spider is this uh, special network. It was a um, circuit switch network that Bell Labs did um, that uh, um, the network researchers actually used Unix to um, uh, drive their research and also the lab used it to copy files around. Um, but uh, the sources for that have been lost. There is one um, source that will set up DMA and do things, but the, all the protocol implementation is, is lost. Um, but it, it dates from 1973. Um, and the spider cell network would later mutate through data kit into become ATM. And the fact that this is the first network implementation, it actually explains a later bit of Unix history. Um, 
it might surprise a lot of people that System 5 didn't have TCP IP until very late after it was able to pull it in from Berkeley. And, and why was that? TCP was the standard. Well, networking was a little bit of a blind spot for, um, for Bell. Bell was the phone company and they had the way of doing the network. You know, I'm speaking in capitals because that was the thinking at Bell uh, in the Bell system was that they had um, the way to do it. And that was circuit switched. Um, but TCP IP and the ARPANET were packet switched. You wouldn't have to create a circuit to send um, an individual message. Um, you know, didn't have to create a session to do that. That was done at a higher level. Um, so it was packet switch. So you could um, distribute things more easily and multiplex hardware more easily. And so when that is the technology that caught on, it caught AT&T a little bit flat footed. And that's why um, the AT&T Unixes didn't have networking until really late. Um, so all of this is going on. Um, and then about a year later, um, the sixth edition comes out. And the sixth edition um, is what a lot of people ran. Network Unix um, that I talked about earlier started on the fifth edition, but uh, quickly migrated to the sixth edition. Um, the Lions book came out, which was the first uh, commentary on Unix available outside of Bell Labs, kind of. Um, and it talked about um, how the system was designed. Uh, and there were four different ports of Unix, one to the LSI 11, which was like a PDP 11 without the MMU hardware, kind of a throwback to the 1120, um, and a couple of different intercell machines. These are 32-bit machines that um, uh, the intercell company that was later bought by Harris um, had produced. And there was also a port to the IBM 360. And I'll talk about these here in a minute. It's also the version that had the first commercial use licenses. Um, so it was distributed to easily over a hundred sites. Um, I couldn't find any reliable figures on how widely it was distributed. Um, but you also start to see, if you look at the um, technical side of things, um, this is the first edition that has uh, uh, an actual installation tape that's available. Um, the only thing that we have before was RKO5 images. Um, there are a number of new system calls uh, and you start to see motion towards standardizing studio. Uh, Mike Lesk produced an IO web, which was the first buffered IO library. Uh, I had a number of problems, which later um, led people to abandon it in favor of studio. Um, <clears throat> and this is also the first version that had commercial licensees. Um, the Rand Corporation uh, was the first commercial license. See, uh, BBN was another early one. Um, in fact, if you go back and look at the early uh, history of the ARPANET, you see a lot of articles from Rand um, that um, are talking about hooking their Unix systems up or that their Unix systems were available for people that wanted to log in to try them. Um, so uh, I guess Studio and Stud.io are uh, two different pronunciations of uh, Studio. And it's probably another GIF versus GIF argument. And I'm not gonna say anything more than that. Um, so the John Lyons commentary on the Unix operating system was uh, officially not very much available. Um, he sold it to one class for a semester or two. Um, AT&T found out and asked him to stop. Um, but oh, oh also, also, by the way, can we print it and distribute it internally? Um, so here's a scan. Um, evidently, this one was signed by John. Um, and it wasn't really re-released until the um, 90s or 2000s when um, Caldera uh, owned the Unix copyright. They finally authorized the release of the Lions Manual with um, a, a new forward written by Dennis Ritchie and it included all the sixth edition source code. 
Um, this was about the same time that Caldera also um, released their um, ancient Unix license, which is why we can go back and look at all these ancient versions of Unix and not worry about copying them and infringing on AT&T's intellectual property. Well, it's not AT&T's intellectual property. It's been sold about a dozen times. Um, and that would make an entire talk of itself of who owns Unix today. And do they really own it or does somebody else own it? Um, so the first Unix distribution, and I'm gonna distinguish between the early stuff that CB Unix did, because that was internal to Bell Labs. This is the first one outside of Bell Labs. And um, a consortium of universities in Australia, um, going by the acronym OSAM, um, was the uh, a group that produced um, Unix in Australia. They did this partially for logistical reasons because sending back to um, the US and New Jersey was Murray Hill was kind of slow. So they um, gathered together uh, their sixth edition of Unix. Um, it included a number of patches that popped up at different Unix conferences. I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, and they focused on bug stat, uh, on um, providing PDP 11s that you could uh, expose uh, a large number of undergraduates to who may not have learned computer ethics yet and they would still be safe and stable and have decent performance so they could get their homework done. Um, and so it was the um, distribution to run. Um, if there's a Australian user group newsletter that talks about this a lot as well about um, different distributions and what's in them and talks about it and so forth. Um, here's the sixth edition family tree. And you'll notice it's gotten quite a bit more complicated than some of the earlier things. It produced a number of different things. It produced the first Unix port, which is the Interdata 732. Um, and uh, that would later become, uh, the, you know, this port was done at Wollongong University. And so the Wollongong group in the United States uh, marketed this to different Harris customers and marketed other things later. Um, it also produced two cut down versions of Unix, which are, um, uh, which is the LSX and mini Unix, which I'll talk about here in a, in a minute. Um, and then, you know, AT&T did their own port um, to uh, Interdata as well unbeknownst to them uh, while uh, Dr. Miller was doing his port. Anyway, if, the, if this will let me go to the next slide. Um, emulation's a hot topic today. FreeBSD has the Linux emulator that is uh, not really an emulator, it's a, 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 a independent implementation of Linux um, that runs under the FreeBSD kernel. But there's a long history of that. If you go back to 4.4 Lite, um, which is the last uh, Berkeley distribution, you'll find that you can run uh, Ultrix and HPUX and a number of other different uh, Unix binaries. And you might think that's um, uh, interesting, but if you go back further, uh, 4.1 BSD had a compat program that lets you run Dungeon, um, which is a copy of Zork. It would become what would become uh, Zork. Um, and it was uh, version seven uh, PDP binaries, PDP 11 binaries. Um, and there's a number of other things, um, you know, going back through the years for different emulations. Uh, Princeton released a bunch of deck utilities um, that could run. They had source license and they compiled it um, with different, uh, uh, with a special um, Unix simulation trap layer that was included in the program. Um, but the earliest version I could find goes back to 76, um, where Bill Webb created um, an RT11 uh, emulator. Um, so he could run uh, for the University of British Columbia, they had a number of scientists that needed to run Fortran programs and they would compile them under Fortran, but they'd wanna run them on the Unix systems because that was easier. Um, and 
it would allow you to either build a special version of the RT11 uh, binaries with native Unix calls, or it would let you um, run an emulated version of RT11 binaries that you might not have source for under the sixth edition. Um, and so the first emulation of other OSs goes very far back into the early history, back to the sixth edition of, uh, of Unix. It's something we take for granted today, but it's been around for a really, really long time. So the first uh, three Unix ports were to the IBM 360 and the Intercell 732. And man, within a few months, they all complete. The Bell Labs port to the Interdata uh, 832 uh, was completed in June of 77. Uh, and it was the third port of Unix. Uh, much to their chagrin. Um, they didn't know about the others that were going on. They might have known about Princeton's efforts. Um, but uh, they started in January and were done by June because they had all the Unix expertise right there. And um, it informed a lot of the portability changes that would go into the seventh edition. Um, it also spawned the portable C compiler, which was critical for a lot of later uh, Unix ports and Minix and even some early Linux um, distributions before it started using GCC. Um, <clears throat> at Princeton, um, Tom Lyon ported the port. This was the first Unix port that was started. It was started in the 75, um, but it wasn't completed until May of 77. So it beat uh, Bell Labs Intercell or Interdata port by just a little bit. Um, this port would later um, was later incorporated in, by Amdahl into UTS. Amdahl hired Tom Lyon to bring his port with him. And, um, you know, he, uh, first thing he did was update it to the seventh edition um, and created UTS. Um, and they also used the portable C compiler from Bell Labs for at least part of their efforts. Um, but the earliest one goes back to the Wollongong University. Um, where they ported uh, to the Interdata 732. It's a slightly cheaper version of the Interdata 832, uh, but they're both 32-bit platforms. Um, and uh, this was the first one to boot on bare iron. And it did that in April, 1977. Um, it has an interesting story where um, there was a professor, um, Dr. Miller, who was hired uh, and he got to the university and found Oh, that money we were going to buy a PDP-11 with, oh, we, we, it kind of was reduced. So we had to buy this inter, Interdata 732. That'll run Unix, right? And so he said, yeah, sure. And, and set about porting Unix. And he created, um, basically ported the C compiler um, that he got with uh, the uh, sixth edition of Unix. He ported that over to Interdata. Um, but it was a paper exercise because even though he had the sources, he didn't have a, any PDP 11s locally to run. So he loaded all this on a tape and drove up to Sydney where he had some friends who had a, a PDP 11 running Unix. Um, and you know he would uh, use that to compile his C compiler. And then you know he brought back the assembler that it generated so that he would have his own C compiler locally and found all kinds of bugs and fixed them in the assembler. And then you know it took him a couple of round trips driving to Sydney and back to do this. And you know, he was very motivated to get this right because that's a long drive. Um, <clears throat> he first brought up uh, Unix as a guest OS under OS 32 um, and where you could run a Unix uh, process um, using a special helper library um, uh, so that they could uh, debug user land before the kernel was ready. Um, it was quite the effort um, as well. At the sixth edition, Unix had already grown too big and too bloated. You know, uh, it at the time needed almost 128 kilobytes um, of memory to run. Um, it basically required a separate instruction and data space. Um, so, and um, you know, it had different uh, areas for the kernel was pretty big, and user programs were starting to get big. So you really needed you know, 256 or half a meg to work. But there were all these cheap little PDP-11s 
or LSI 11s that had almost no memory. So um, mini Unix was created by uh, Dr. Uh, Lak Lama, um, who also had created MERT. Um, and a lot of people who had these low-end PDP 11s uh, ran this. Um, it was distributed outside of Bell Labs, uh, although not officially. And um, version of this, there is a version that survives, but there were a lot of uh, versions and a lot of patches, and it's kind of difficult to use. Um, in fact, uh, Dr. Uh, Laklama did two uh, versions. Um, he did one for a, um, a miniaturized uh, PDP-11, but he also did one for uh, the LSI-11, which was an even smaller machine with different hardware constraints and he needed to fit on a floppy. So he produced LSX for that. Um, also around this time, we get the first good externally published manual. Um, uh, Unix sources came with manuals and you could print the manuals off. But this is the first um, set of documentation uh, that talked about um, some of the larger design and some of the application notes, some of the places that uh, these programs were used. Um, this is a snapshot of the uh, Bell System Technical Journal um, from 1978. Uh, you can find this on the Internet Archive. Um, and it is a lot of the stuff that uh, I was talking about, including um, kind of a distributed processing system where uh, a mini computer would accept um, jobs to run from remote systems and then return the results. So kind of like an early RPC um, where uh, the, res the, 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 the central mini computer would be used for these remote systems um, as well. In addition, there was, uh, documentation on what would become the uh, documenter's workbench. Um, and there was um, talk about the programmer's workbench and all the things you could do with it. It was really, you know, it was the technical journal to have for a while. <clears throat> and so um, version seven was taking a while to get out. Um, if you'll notice up through version six, there was a release every year, or every few months. And then between 1975 and 79, this huge gap and so in the middle of this gap, Dennis Ritchie came up with uh, a set of 50 diffs that would take a version six system and turn it into a version seven system, eh, for the most part. And, um, you know, he had created these systems to help uh, their internal efforts uh, migrate uh, for the programmer workbench and CB Unix and then all of them, you know, to migrate to the latest version of research Unix. And he also put these um, on a tape that he left laying around the terminal room at one of the early USENIX meetings. And people found it and saw what was on it and copied the heck out of it and went everywhere. And it had, um, in addition to having these diffs on it, it had uh, a newer version of C, which is sometimes you'll see called typesetter C. And it's probably the first version that um, it's almost KNR level. It had long and unsigned uh, data types uh, create a union and type defs. Um, bit field support was added, static was added, uh, if defs were added, um, and it, some enhanced um, expressions. It used to be you just had if def this thing and it added if defined or not defined or x less than y. Um, and you know, this is kind of one of the first viral spreads of, um, you know, of, of, of maybe slightly illicit material. Now, if you didn't have uh, a sixth edition Unix system, this tape would be useless because it was a series of patches. But still, um, it caused a little bit of consternation. And so I'm gonna um, wind up my talk here with the seventh edition. The seventh edition Unix tried to, to pull together all of these different threads that I've talked about, although um, some of them would have to wait for AT&T's later commercialization. Um, this version of Unix was ported everywhere. Um, this is just a, a small sample of the, the systems. And this was the first system that AT&T allowed people to have binary distributions for. And it was the basis for all future things. It first served as the basics for POSIX um, before the System 5 interface documents uh, were created. 
Um, and it, in some people's minds, is the you know Unix went downhill from here. And as you can see, it just spawned all kinds of um, additional systems uh, and uh, ports. Um, you know, CentOS owes its uh, lineage to that. Uh, Berkeley owes their lineage to it. Um, uh, there was this crazy thing called Unis that let you run um, BSD uh, Unix uh, binaries in a Unix environment on VMS that was spawned from it. It's just, it created a, a, a rather large ecosystem. And this chart, it just gathers a tiny part of it. So if I remember my slides correctly, um, oh yeah, uh, a lot of stuff was in version seven. If you go back and use version seven, I'm not gonna go through this big long list because this talk is already crazy long. Um, Version seven is the first Unix that I could probably pop most people in front of and have them be able to get by. Um, now, some of the commands do have some of the arguments and some of the commands we have today that are a little bit more obscure, didn't exist. You're not gonna be able to type get on this. The address space was too small. Um, but if you're typing in a Unix shell, um, it's very much like uh, FreeBSD's bin sh without um, command history. Um, and so it's very familiar. Um, little things like CD work in sixth edition, it had to be Chadur. Um, CD was short for Chadur and that, it's from version seven on, but in version six, you have to type Chadur and it's one of the most annoying things of working on early Unix systems. There's no, um, uh, you know, no way to create that alias. Um, and, and a lot of the features from a version seven also came from PWB. We get lint and make and lex and yak and awk and sed, um, all of those uh, and tar, all of those came in with version seven. Um, and a few things that wound up not catching on that I don't have time to, to talk about. But version seven um, is where we're ending this talk um, because it's the first one that had fan art. This is a t-shirt from an early Usenix that Phil Foglio did um, that uh, is the basis for the Berkeley Demon. Um, and I got a copy of this from uh, Kirk McCusick's uh, Beastie uh, archive. Um, and it also sparked a number of marketing. This is a early Ultrix poster that I unearthed a few years ago that I found in my collection. That was, um, uh, an attempt to kind of um, take Phil Foglio's early, um, you know, kind of quaint and homey system and show that, well, DEC cleaned it up and fixed all the bugs. And that's partially true, partially marketing, but, uh, you know, DEC's versions of things were much better than the original research version, but maybe not quite as good as Berkeley's. Um, and so this isn't all about dinosaurs. I have to brag a little. Um, uh, I also fixed dinosaurs. I, I don't know why I have this slide in here, honestly. But um, if you ever need a dinosaur, porcelain dinosaur that's been broken um, and you have all the pieces, I can glue it together, back together and paint it so it looks like nothing ever happened to it. Um, my name is a anagram for her owls ran. I don't know why I, I included that, but I did. And if you want to look at a lot of the systems that I talked about, um, unix50.org has a number of virtual machines that you can just log into. You don't have to try to download them and use them that way. So um, I think that's all I got today. Yeah, that's the last slide. So I don't know if anybody's still listening or they're still recording this or anything. Um, I'm going to try to turn my video back on. I'm going to stop sharing. No, we're still here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. Oh wow. It's not That's a nice version. hour and a half talk. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I've got the. Uh, um, That's right. Yeah. Copper plated statue. statuettes that the early that were available in the early days, um, that are gracing my shelves to this day. 
Turns out my BC was in the same country, by the way. Also made in Germany. Oh, they were both made in Germany, yes. Okay, yes. In <clears throat> yeah, in fact. Inside the PDP-11. <laughs> oh, yes, inside the PDP-11, we have the dinosaur. Also made in Germany, it turns out. <laughs> I need to mount this on the wall, but uh, maybe that's why I put it in the slides, you know? I'm going a little bit stir crazy and I need a chance to brag. So uh, it's stored inside the PDP-11. <clears throat> so anyway, um, I, I answered a bunch of questions as we went along I'd, and I haven't seen any additional ones. Yeah, I don't think so. I think um, you hit the ones people have asked. Yep. <clears throat> um, people really like the poster there, from, from uh, digital, by the way. They really like that. Yeah. I'm still looking for a good frame for it, but uh, here's kind of the live version of it. Well, oh. It is completely decided that's part of the key. Yeah, that's, that's part of the background. So hold on a second. We will uh, turn off the virtual background, which is the thing that makes my system laggy, I'm sure. And be able to- well, That's a nice idea. Maybe with a little bit of, yeah. I got this because I have attended a uh, DECUS meeting um, in Albuquerque when I was going to school and they were handing these out. And I, I didn't realize how cool it was until um, I found it in a poster tube and when I was cleaning out a pickup to sell it a few years ago. It's like, oh, is that? Wow. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that is cool. Hey, I'll tell you, one of the coolest things about the having a virtual conference is the fact that we could do this and you know per personalize it a little bit and yeah. just make it sort of fun and interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can see the dinosaurs on the floor back there. <clears throat> And you're not, and you're not, we always refer to Kirk McKusick. Uh, I don't know if he's on here, so, but we always refer to him as a dinosaur. <laughs> Kirk is no, not a dinosaur. When dinosaurs and mainframes roam the earth, I think that's Kirk's line. <laughs> that's Kirk's line, yes. He, he arrives slightly after that. Yes. <clears throat> slightly. <laughs> I'll say slightly. So um, anyway, that's, that's my talk for today. If anybody has any questions or anything, um, that uh, um, you know, I uh, uh, haven't gone into. Um, you know, I'm happy to to do that. Some of these things I could do an entire talk on. Um, you know, the early images of the demon are hard to come by as well. I couldn't find a copy of this poster online, um, although I could find um, a copy of the Unix Wars, which was earlier in the presentation which I have yes on my uh, on my wall and there were three different versions of that and I got this one at a trade show not realizing how cool it was it was also in the poster tube that was in the truck you know it, it had fallen behind the seat and I'm like oh what's this and you know there were a bunch of uh, early um, network OSI ISO um, network stacks even with T and stuff. Oh yeah, it was you know X.400 and X.500 and X.93 and just all this stuff that you know just nobody cares about anymore. So well let's see here. Well, I think we are probably good for the day. Uh, I think we're good for the day. I don't see any other questions on IRC. I do thank you for your talk, Warner, and for taking the time oh, you bet. to tour for the early history. Um, I think it'll be neat uh, one day bet. to have some of the, uh, the early history of FreeBSD at one of these conferences. So I think, while some of us may have been there for parts of it, there, there were some folks who weren't. <laughs> um, but it might be interesting to learn about some of that at another time. But thank you for your talk this time. It was very interesting. There was a lot of stuff that happened um it's good to be appreciative of even the little things um and how much, oh, how yeah. much advance over time 
Yes, you know, it was, it was fun doing the research and, and digging in. And it was, there were a lot of surprises, which is why I, I pitched the talk originally, uh, because, you know, I consider myself well-read and I hadn't heard three quarters of this stuff. You know, it wasn't part of my computer curriculum. So I thought it'd be nice to get it out there. Yeah, I agree. All righty. Well, I think that's it for today's day of the FreeBSD Vendor Summit. So everyone can take the rest of the day off, do whatever you need to do for the rest of the day. And we'll see you all bright and early or bright and late, depending on your time zone, um, tomorrow <laughs> for our second day. Uh, so thank you all. And we'll see you tomorrow. See you.